Hello. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're tuning in from. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Sam Ankerson. I'm the executive director of the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum. And we're uh, thrilled that you've joined us for tonight's talk with Dan Killam about his work with giant clams in the biosphere. This is the next talk in our celebrating 25 years lecture series. And we thank Dan very much for joining us um, from Arizona. And we'll introduce him in just a moment. Uh, his topic is really interesting. Uh, he he came, to, came to light for us by, uh, from Jose Leal, the museum's science director and curator who knows Dan and is familiar with his work when we were thinking about speakers for this series. And, and having the opportunity to talk to Dan a couple of times via Zoom and, and check out some of the really terrific online videos of his work. Uh, it was evident how interesting and forward-looking his work is in the area of uh, clams and climate change and the connections between the two and other ecological elements. So it's we're 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 glad he's here and, and also just the the facility itself where it works at Biosphere 2, which you can see an image up on your, on your screen, is just the coolest thing. And um, just seeing more of that is, uh, is, is a treat as well. For those of you who haven't had a chance yet to visit the new living gallery at the museum here in Sanibel, the first aquarium that you encounter is actually a Pacific coral reef system, beautiful beautiful exhibit with a lot of different kinds of marine life. But at its, at its core are four different species of giant clams. We've actually just added a couple new ones. So I hope that Dan's talk tonight will offer you some new perspective on, on that exhibit and on your next visit to the museum. A couple of housekeeping notes, or maybe just one housekeeping note. Uh, with regard to questions and answers, we will be doing those at the end of Dan's presentation. And this being a Zoom webinar format, the way to do that is to use the chat function and type in your questions. So that, that'll be along the bottom uh, of, your, of your screen. You move your cursor along the bottom, see the, see the chat button, type in your questions. Uh, I'll keep track of those. And then, and then at the conclusion of Dan's presentation, we'll, we'll to questions and answers. We have two more talks coming up in the Celebrating 25 Years online lecture series. The next is on Thursday, September 28th, or it might be a Tuesday, but the date is September 28th with Shelburne Museum curators, Gene Burks and Corey Rogers. And their topic, uh, their title is Shell Dressed shells in jewelry and fashion will be very entertaining that's on september 28th and on october 21st our own jose leal does a halloween special on scary mollusks so look for more information and registration information on the museum's website shellmuseum.org they are free to attend and uh, and you can find more information there so without further ado then, I'll introduce Dan. Uh, Dan Killam is a postdoctoral researcher at Biosphere 2, University of Arizona. He's also a paleontologist who specializes in comparing the geochemistry of fossil and modern mollusk shells. Dan completed his undergraduate degree at USC and his PhD in earth science at University of California at Santa Cruz. He studied bittersweet clams at the University of Haifa in Israel before beginning his current project, Culturing Giant Clams at Biosphere 2. Also, before Dan begins, I just want also to wish him a slightly belated but very happy birthday. He had a, a birthday earlier this week, and I know it's rude to divulge age, and I won't do that, but suffice to say that Dan has made a lot of contributions to his field and accomplished a whole lot in a short period of time. So happy birthday, Dan. Thank you very much for, for joining us from Arizona and thank all of you for joining us. And with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Dan. 
Well, thanks for that lovely introduction. And it's really an honor to be talking to the Bailey Matthews Museum. I've been following you guys on social media for a long time. Uh, I, I think about shells all day and I still learn a lot from uh, Jose's posts about obscure clams. And so I, it's on my bucket list to get there in person someday, but until then this will have to do. Um, but yeah, today I'm gonna be talking about my uh, work at uh, Biosphere 2 in, uh, in Arizona. I'm near Tucson, just north of Tucson, near a little town called Oracle. And a Biosphere 2 um, is uh, a unique setting in which to conduct the research that was discussed with you guys today. So let me go to the next slide. So this is a view of Biosphere 2 from the air. And uh, you guys might be familiar with the story of Biosphere 2. It was built in the, the late 80s, early 90s as an enclosed 3.1 acre uh, basically a giant terrarium in which to conduct uh, a research on on the, the way that the earth uh, the way the earth can support humans and vice versa. So at the time they actually sealed eight biospherians researchers uh, inside of Biosphere 2 for two years um, with a sealed air supply, uh, limited you know only what they could grow for food and uh, um, re re recycling even their water. And so, um, during that experiment, uh, they discovered a lot about, uh, about how uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen vary through time in relation to uh, the activity of humans and microbes. But these days, we're not locked inside Biosphere anymore. Uh, biosphere anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm relieved to say I get to go home to my apartment every day. But um, it's run by the University of Arizona now. And we, within this biosphere, we have a desert ecosystem, a rainforest ecosystem, a savanna ecosystem, a mangrove one. And uh, of course, of most interest to me is the ocean uh, biome, which is uh, uh, the Biosphere Ocean is a 700,000 gallon saltwater tank. It's so big, it's kind of hard to put in perspective. I'm standing by it right now, um, but um, I'm not sure if you can see my video, but I'll show you guys after during the Q&A as well. But it's a, uh, to put it in perspective, an Olympic swimming pool is about 660,000 gallons. So this is about 10% bigger than that. And it's full of salt water. Um, and uh, all sorts of living creatures. Back in the early biosphere days, it contained a functioning coral reef. Uh, over the years, that reef uh, died out during uh, different ownership changes that happened in the history of biosphere. But uh, these days, um, there's been a lot of remediation going on to get the coral reef aspect of this tank recovered. Uh, that included removing several tons of algae, introducing all sorts of new reef fish, um, including some that are uh, native to Florida, and uh, also invertebrates like uh, like hermit crabs and snails. And, and uh, there's a new uh, heat exchanger to keep temperatures year round at 77 Fahrenheit, a lot like you'd see in the Florida Keys, for example. And uh, there's new initiatives to culture, to grow small corals on site with the intention in the next uh, few months to introduce those little corals into the broader biosphere tank to get that reef started growing again. And most uh, typical, uh, you know, uh, most uh, applicable to this talk is that we have giant clams growing in the ocean for the first time is since 1992. So what are giant clams? It's a, a unique subfamily of bivalves. Bivalves in this case, as you guys as shell people probably know, are, are a, a class of mollusks, including oysters, mo uh, mussels, scallops, et cetera. But giant clams are rather special uh, in that they're, they have, their soft tissue is full of this symbiotic algae, uh, which is the same type that's found in reef building corals. Um, it's a think of your think of it if your flesh was bright green and to get your lunch you went out and took a sun took a suntan for an hour. Uh, the algae are providing the clams with sugars and uh, directly aiding in the growth of their shells. And in exchange, the host clam is providing that algae with carbon, nitrogen, and a stable environment in which to live. Um, giant clams, as their name suggests, can grow up to three feet in size. Some species. And uh, they're down to about half a foot, uh, some of the smaller species. Um, the ones we're growing at Biosphere 2 are called Tridacna durasa, the smooth giant clam, which I believe you guys also have growing at uh, the Bailey Matthews Museum. So uh, why am I studying giant clams? Well, uh, first of all, as you, might, you guys might be familiar, being from Florida, that um, the uh, coral, re coral reefs worldwide are under threat from a changing climate. Uh, because the warm, uh, warming ocean is causing them to expel their algae in a process called bleaching, um, which, which uh, uh, often leads to their uh, demise. And this is happening all over the world. In addition, uh, coral reefs are threatened by over-harvesting, habitat destruction, and other, other stressors. 
Um, but there's a lot of research right now going on into the symbiosis that corals have with algae. And uh, that's actually the spe specialization of uh, my advisor, um, Diane Thompson at the U of A. But there's little known comparatively of how giant clams will fare comparatively in the face of climate change. Are they gonna be more resilient to those changes that corals are stressed out by or less resilient? It's important to know these things because unfortunately around the world, giant clam populations have been severely uh, depressed by over collection. Their shells are worth hundreds of dollars. And um, while the countries that grow these, uh, that have these clams native to them, like the Philippines and Australia and, and uh, uh, um, places like that, um, while they're now becoming aware that the clams are worth more in the water than they are, um, you know, as a souvenir in someone's bathroom, it's still a, a huge number of clams, tons of shells a year being extracted from the ocean. Um, so my prior work before I got to Biosphere, I, I did some work in Israel in the Northern Red Sea during my PhD, where we found actually that giant clams are growing faster, wild giant clams are growing faster in the Northern Red Sea. Um, how did we figure that out? Uh, well, uh, we can actually use the growth lines in the shell, much like the rings of a tree. You can figure out how fast the clam was growing, how many years it lived, and other, fact, other aspects of its life. Uh, its shell is essentially a diary of its life, and we can read that diary both in the fossil clams and the modern clams. Uh, we can even read every day in that diary in giant clams. Uh, if you look at your fingernail and the thickness of your fingernail, a giant clam is growing, you know, a, a small, a probably a quarter of the thickness of their fingernail every day. But over the life of the clam, that actually manifests as, uh, you know, them becoming giant in size. And I've highlighted a couple of those daily bands and a microscope picture of a shell. We dye the shells blue to make those bands more visible. But don't worry, if I visit the Bailey Matthews Museum, I will not be getting out my angle grinder to cut a shell open to uh, take uh, geochemical samples. But that is something we've done in the past with uh, wild clams. Um, so why are they growing faster? There are some suggestions from the chemistry of the clam shells. Um, we can look at the record of nitrogen in the shell of the clam, and that actually relates directly to the diet that the clam was taking in. And there are suggestions through the diary of the clam that by the time they grow to be a, a big old clam with a happy, healthy symbiosis, they're actually recording chemical signals more in line with uh, uh, the eating directly the nitrate sourced from human pollution. Uh, uh, our cars and our power plants emit nitrogen that reacts in the atmosphere to form a uh, comp uh, chemical called nitrate. And in the Red Sea, that nitrate is delivered into the ocean via dust storms. And it appears the clams are taking in that nitrogen as a fertilizer for their algae. Um, just like you might put miracle Grow on your house plant at home. Um, they are doing that within their bodies to assist the algae. However, um, while that's a good suggestion that the symbiosis is fertilized in the present compared to the past, it's still not a smoking gun of uh, how he healthy are the algae within the clam in the fossil times and the modern times. We need a direct measure of the health of the symbionts uh, that we can apply to compare fossil and modern clams. And that's what this uh, Biosphere project is all about. So now I am going to show you guys a short video touring around the Biosphere. Um, it's embedded in my PowerPoint, and in case in case it's a uh, choppy for you, I've also putting I'm putting a YouTube link to the same talk, uh, same eight minute uh, video in the chat that you can open up later uh, whenever you feel like. But I'm going to play the video for you to kind of give you a tour in the, my typical day here at Biosphere. Well, folks, I just plugged in my car next to the solar panels, and now I'm going to head in and show you what a typical day the office is like. Here's my office. Uh, it was one of the uh, crew apartments for the original Biospherians. Um, it's a lofted apartment and they lived in here for two years in the early 90s um, in a sealed airspace, um, nothing going in and out. So uh, I don't know which crew member lived in here, but I now have my workspace. All, of course, we're strewn with various cables and loggers and. Um, this is where I plot up my data and drink my coffee and uh, troubleshoot stuff and sometimes zoom in here. But it's a very eccentric office space, uh, but it serves me pretty well, fairly comfortable. Well, here we are at the education lab. This is where we uh, would be leading school groups and stuff on tours if we were doing such things, but we're not. But I'm here to show you my three favorite office mates. We got Floater, 
the uh, Garibaldi. Link, the Domino Damselfish. It's kind of hard to see. And we have Dennis, the Coral Hawkfish. They're all three are very sassy. And they are surprisingly curious about me when I come in to heat up my coffee. But we got all sorts of cool specimens in here, including an example of uh, Tridacna uh, squamosa, a, uh, the fluted giant clam. Um, it's kind of an example of the goals I have for my guys about how, hope, how big we hope to get them. So here we are at the ocean under the biosphere, the main biosphere uh, space frame, which is uh, consists of uh, the metal frame with triangular glass um, panels between in a matrix. Um, here's under this tarp is where I have a lot of my computing equipment related to monitoring the light levels and the clams. I have it under the type, uh, tarp because we get a lot of condensation dripping in here. Um, here's uh, the lighting rig that keeps the clams alive and the clams are actually under the water here um, can't really see them right now with the glare but uh, we have 11 no 12 clams down there of uh, Tridacna dorosa the smooth giant clam and uh, some of them have been growing since May so I get in and snorkel every couple days to check them out do various procedures with them. Um, I'll describe it a little more what we're doing when I get to our lab space. But I spend a lot of time here on the beach um, working with the computer stuff and and also getting in the water to uh, check out the clams and how they're doing. Uh, I'll describe that more in my talk. So I unpacked uh, the computing stuff from uh, to show you guys, and uh, we have a Raspberry Pi computer um, uh, hooked up to our uh, the monitor here, so I can program uh, program the Arduino, which is connected to the Raspberry Pi. Um, Arduino is like a, a smart circuit board, basically a microcontroller that I use uh, to connect to these uh, cables and read. The uh, current, I mean, uh, the voltage coming back from those uh, clamp sensors, and uh, then the uh, Raspberry Pi is logging it, and uh, um, you can see the live data rolling in here every second, and uh, that that data is telling us how open or closed the clams are uh, based on the strength of the voltage coming back, because uh, we have a magnet, like this is a stack of the magnets I use attached to one side of the clamp and a magnetic, magnetic sensor on the other side, and that gives us the readout of uh, whether the clam is open or closed. We also have, uh, under the lighting rig, we have um, a light sensor from Lycor, uh, and uh, a couple of data loggers measuring pH and uh, dissolved oxygen through time, and as well as temperature. And uh, on the other side of the ocean, we have a uh, a hanging sensor off of that boom uh, uh, so we can kind of see spatially how those uh, data points vary through the biosphere ocean so um, it'll be interesting uh, to compare those two time series but here you can see the logger for the light is showing that we're uh, above 318 micromoles of photons per meter squared per second which is that very good for the clams um, that's a good amount of light for them well within the range of what keeps the species happy, and so that means that I'm happy, knowing that they're going to be uh, their their symbiotic algae are content because the sun's shining bright and their lights are shining bright, 
and that means they're growing their shells happily, making their growth line for the day, which means that, uh, you know, happy clams means happy Dan. Here we are in the analytical lab, which is in one of the satellite buildings on the Biosphere campus. All sorts of cool work happening in here. Uh, they're conducting a long-term study of the, the weekly variability in the algae and plankton uh, within the Biosphere ocean water. But for me, I'm typically just prepping my samples for geochemical analysis uh, over at the University of Arizona campus. Um, uh, here we have a couple of shells of the creatures we work with. This is Tridacna squamosa. Uh, this guy had uh, met his demise when uh, we had a power outage and he rolled himself down the hill and uh, deprived himself of light, unfortunately. They can get themselves into trouble sometimes, these clams. And, uh, but I was able to recover his shell and uh, you could see that uh, he did not die in vain for the purposes of my experiment because uh, we see fresh shell growth. This white stuff at the edge of the shell margin is uh, really the product we're interested in. Um, it's uh, the, the record of his life here in Biosphere 2's ocean water, and it's recording the ramp up of his symbiosis as uh, they, they, uh, they ramp up the uh, degree of, of uh, nutrition they get from the algae within their bodies as they develop. Um, here's an example of uh, Darasa that d died during that powder out power outage as well, a smooth giant clam. And you can see he as well has fresh white shell. It really is... Uh, is, uh, represents uh, what we're interested in measuring as a diary of his own development. Well, now you got an idea of the typical life of a clam man here at Biosphere 2, um, but uh, I'm gonna continue and answer all your questions and give you a little live demo um, from the ocean shore. So, well, oh, um, next slide, oops. let's go. So just to give you a quick recap of all of that and some, some updates since I made that video. Um, we were, we've been able to measure uh, light and activity levels of the clams over the course of over a year, the longest experiment uh, on captive clams uh, ever conducted. And um, we're measure we intend to measure the chemistry of their shell as well as some fluid that we collect from within the shell uh, through time in relation to the activity of their algae inside of them. Uh, so the, the farming has been a success. We introduced some one batch of clams in Mar uh, May 2020 um, and another in uh, September 2020, uh, we introduced three species, but since then we've discovered that Tridacna durasa is the most uh, effective at growing and thriving in the Biosphere 2 ocean. These clams started at about three inches and, and have now, uh, they are now varying between six and seven inches in, in uh, length. And uh, so that doubling in size in about a year is, is uh, typical for the species. They grow very quickly. Through that time, I learned that clams are eager to get themselves into trouble. If there's any um, sign of very, you know, like a loss of light, such as during the power outage, they will seek greener pastures. And uh, unfortunately that meant in this case, they rolled themselves down the hill. So I made them a paddock, a, 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 you know, a clam paddock to keep them in, uh, basically put a fence in for them to, uh, sometimes it really is like, uh, you know, they say herding cats is trouble, but uh, herding clams is, is, also, is also a challenge sometimes. Uh, the clams, they like to snuggle together, um, just like you and I, if we were in the wild, might like to live back to back, um, uh, you know, to uh, safety in numbers, um, to uh, make sure we uh, see threats coming from every direction. The clams do the same thing. They move next to each other so that they, uh, they, they, they feel safer together. Um, uh, we learned that only fireworm hardened species are going to thrive in bi uh, biosphere ocean. There's these creatures in the biosphere ocean called fireworms that are a predator. And, uh, and uh, um, the other species of, were the main cause for why the other species of clams did not do so well. Uh, but Durasa, for uh, reasons I'll discuss, um, the smooth giant clam is more resilient to that predation. Um, we also uh, uh, figured out that uh, 
more light, the more light the clams, the better it is for them. They, they really um, structure their entire day and all of their activity around, around the availability of light. And I'll show you some of that data in a couple slides. So what kind of data are we taking during the course of this, of this experiment? Well, I have one project uh, ongoing, uh, collaborating with uh, Daria Kainak at the University of South Florida. We're trying to understand uh, changes in the color of the clams through time, uh, just using uh, uh, photos taken regularly through time. Um, we have uh, observed some changes in uh, the colors of the clams. Uh, some have become uh, more orange in pigmentation, and some have changed in how they uh, they have these stripes of, of, of reflective material that we call iridophores. So basically, it's the same principle as uh, you when you put a stripe of sunblock across your nose when you go surfing to protect yourself from the sun. The clam is using sunblock within its skin to uh, manipulate the light and block out harmful light. So it's able to help its symbionts by directing the good light and reflect that light away. And we've observed some changes in the pattern of those iridophores through time. We're, we're putting hard numbers on that through some uh, statistical techniques. Another thing we're doing is uh, the clams have a little pocket of fluid uh, that we call it extra paleo fluid. Uh, it's between their soft tissue and their shell. And if you put take a, a flexible syringe tip in there, uh, between the edge of the shell and the edge of their tissue, you can, in a non-harmful way, you can uh, uh, collect uh, a, a couple milliliters at a time of that uh, fluid and measure the chemistry of it. So we've sampled at repeated in intervals through uh, the experiment to see is the clam uh, controlling, uh, is actively controlling the chemistry of this fluid? How does that relate to the chemistry of the shell and the chemistry of the water around the clam? It's a tough process and it, uh, I'll show you a video of it here. But uh, here I am with my colleague, uh, Megan Russell, uh, collecting the Getting out the syringe to put together. We're only in about three feet of water. So uh, Megan is putting our eraser there to help race the clam to make sure it doesn't close completely um, so that I can collect the fluid. Um, but you might notice that this clam in particular doesn't really react uh, uh, very strongly to, uh, to the uh, collection of the fluid. It uh, would see a much more a violent sudden closure if it was uh, very disturbed by the process. So this clam was very good for you. Collect a few milliliters of the material, uh, the fluid. And I'm going to give you all OK. And uh, paying 10. Uh, so that's what we do on a monthly to bi monthly basis. Um, as I mentioned, we also have valve sensors in the clam. This is a process called uh, valvometry. Uh, so these clams are little cyborgs. Um, uh, we uh, have put this has been used in, for all sorts of species of bivalves to measure water quality and uh, the, um, their feeding activity and for the clams, uh, these giant clams, it's only been used uh, a couple times in the literature and we're trying to develop a system that's very inexpensive and easily obtainable parts um, to ensure that these, these sensors could be applied in more places like in a tropics, tropical countries, developing countries where these clams grow. Um, and uh, the, the team at Biosphere has been a huge help. Uh, Doug Klein and Wei Ren uh, are at, uh, our technicians here who have helped me with constructing these sensors. So, it's kind of an example of exactly the expertise we need here at Biosphere 2 uh, to conduct our research. It's a team effort. So to show you some of the data coming back from these sensors, uh, uh, on the top, we have basically the higher the top chart, the higher the value, the more closed the clam is. And uh, the bottom chart is showing um, the light levels that the clams are experiencing, uh, how many photons of light the, clam, uh, the clams are taking in. And um, to point out some major trends to you, um, uh, the clams are mostly uh, part, uh, basking wide open in the daylight hours. They open a, it, on average a couple hours before the sunrise starts because the peak sunlight hours are, um, are you know, between 8 and 10 a.m. And the clams start opening a couple hours before that. Um, uh, but at, at once the uh, sunlight decreases in the afternoon as the sun goes behind some trees we have over the biosphere ocean, the clams start to close their shells to a partially closed, like about half closed, um, level. And they're doing this as kind of a de defensive posture 
Um, so like if you were in a big scary forest with a predator around you, the clam is in a big scary forest where it wants to, like we would, might crouch down and try to stay hidden. The clam is partially closing itself as a protective measure. Um, this is kind of showing you what they look like open versus closed. But um, um, they, they close their shells to protect themselves from these guys, fireworms, um, that are an opportunistic predator. Um, they uh, try to enter the clams mostly through the rear of the shell, actually, um, from the bottom. And uh, these, uh, when the clam senses that, it closes suddenly in a process uh, kind of, we call, I've been calling valve clapping. These are short, full closure events. Um, and those, are, those events are twice as frequent at night. Um, they're also used in addition to uh, evading predators. They're used to expel the stuff we call pseudofeces. That's unwanted debris that it's gotten through its process of filter feeding. Because these clams, in addition to the solar power that they get from their algae inside of them, they also are eating all the plankton and other stuff passing in the water by them. Um, so they're getting to have their cake and eat it too. They get to eat, live off the filter feeding just like other bivalves, but they're also getting that uh, symbiosis uh, energy. Um, so some closures are longer during the day when they see me. They uh, tend to close um, because they can see you coming. They have little eyes. And um, um, so uh, here's a video of a truly giant clam, a three footer uh, uh, from the Philippines uh, doing its closure. <laughs> and that splashing is kind of a defensive mechanism of the clam. Uh, you, in, under the water, when you're next to a big clam, you can kind of feel that like a breeze on your face. And it could, that, that process could disturb a predator. So for me, I find it kind of amusing. So um, I hear I'm disconnected from Zoom. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Dan. Oh, yeah. Did you lose me for a second? Um, no, we got gotcha. you. We got gotcha. you. Okay. Oh, I got a video saying, please join the Zoom. Okay, good, good. All right, we go back in. All right, um, so the next phase in our process is uh, to take the chemistry of the shells of these plants. Um, so in our lab, uh, we have a, um, a uh, very sensitive robotically controlled drill called a micro mill. And uh, it uses the same kind of drill bit that you would use at the dentist. That's why I muted the video because it might be, uh, it, you know, some people might be disturbed and reminded of the dentist, but it uses this very tiny drill bit to take tiny samples of powder. And um, those uh, little bits of powder, we can measure the elements in the powder. Uh, we're most interested in the ratio of boron to calcium in that powder, because that actually can relate to the, um, to the uh, pH in the animal. Um, we've, that's never been demonstrated for giant clams, but it's something new that could be the smoking gun that we need to show the activity of the algae. Um, we're also measuring other chemical records uh, from the clams in co collaboration with researchers all over the world, including at Syracuse um, University and the University of Southampton, UK. Um, we're trying to figure out uh, how the clams support diet and the pH in their shells using those alternative methods, basically uh, me measuring the clams biology in all sorts of ways to find that, that exact right relationship that we need to try to understand how the symbiosis uh, worked in the past. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that have helped me with this clam project. It really takes a village to get this project off the ground. Um, and uh, and um, with that, I'll open it up to y'all for uh, questions. So uh, um, hit me with all your questions about, I know that you guys are, are shell, a shell interested in crowd uh, hearing about me through the uh, Bailey Museum. So I'm interested to hear the stories and the questions you have. Thank you so much, Dan. That was terrific. Um, Yes, with your with your questions, uh, use the use the chat feature along the bottom and, and type them in, and we'll 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 read them back to Dan. I have a couple. Um, in the, in the meantime, I mean, one the the uh, well, first of all, I, a comment, I guess your 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 capability in in creating slide presentations that use video and toggle back and forth between slides and video is is You've set a new standard for the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum online lecture series. So nice job, and, and thank you for that. But the video of um, of the three foot Indonesian, you know, the valve clapping, the, the you know, the, so that was pretty. That was pretty amazing to me, and and it led me just to want to ask how how large do these clams get? I mean, that's a that's a that's a big animal. Yeah. So giant clams uh, vary by species and how big they get. 
but the true giant clam, Tridacna gigas is the species name. That guy is found from the Philippines down to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and he, those can grow in excess of three feet in, in length and weigh hundreds of pounds. Um, and they can live, it's not actually known how long they can live at their maximum length, but it's estimated uh, that they could live over a hundred years um, uh, at their, at their uh, maximum extent. Wow, oh, amazing. Um, so we do have a couple questions from the floor, as it were, uh, from Phyllis. Are you studying what impact warming oceans and acidification will have on giant clams? Yeah, so uh, warming oceans, not as much um, because we keep the temperature at a very steady 77 Fahrenheit here uh, with a small, you know, half a degree variation during the course of a day. Um, but acidification, definitely. We have been measuring the pH of the water around the clams. And there is variation in the pH of the water around the clams over the course of the year. So we are interested in how that feeds into the clams growth. Um, even more interesting to us is how is the pH of the, within the animal vary? Because that is controlled by the symbionts. And if we have an understanding of how much that varies uh, within the animal, that could give us an idea of what they can tolerate in their external environment. Uh, because as you guys probably know, the oceans are growing more acidic with time as we emit CO2 that dissolves in the oceans and makes them more acidic. So we are very interested in that question. Thank you. Question from Jennifer. What is the average life of the giant clam? And what do we know thus far about climate change and the impact on their lifespan? Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, the giant clams, we don't actually have a good upper limit of their lifespan. Uh, some people have estimated 100 years, but there's not a whole lot of hard math behind that number. That's just what they theoretically could be capable of because they can grow indefinitely. Uh, it's been proven definitively that they could live at least 60 years. And um, normally in the wild, there's very, uh, uh, the, the limiting factor is that they start to get overgrown by corals around them. And, and that ends up being the biggest uh, limiting la aspect on their lifespan. Uh, unfortunately, the biggest limiter on giant clam lifespans these days is humans. Um, we, uh, we find their shells very valuable and, uh, um, and especially if it's a big shell. And, uh, and so um, there's, a, there's a tension there between leaving the giant clam in the ocean and removing it uh, for, uh, 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 for uh, all sorts of uses in, in the private market. Um, but uh, yeah, that would be my answer to the question. Thank you. All right, um, some more questions here. From Linda, how long have you been in the biosphere and when will your project there be completed? Yeah, so I've been working at Biosphere since last May, though I started remotely because of the pandemic, Biosphere was light, uh, largely shut down for most of last summer. And so the clams actually beat me here because the, the great ocean team who were considered essential workers during the pandemic to keep the ocean alive um, were able, uh, led by Katie Morgan here, they were able to introduce the clams uh, to, to the ocean. And of course, you might imagine that was rather sad, uh, frustrating for me watching over Zoom as, as the, the lovely, wonderful clams I'd read so much and planned so much about, uh, watching them only remotely. So I was very eager to get over here, which I did last August. And then we introduced another batch in September. Um, so uh, my project, uh, my funding on this current part of the project will last through May. And then um, after that, I'm hoping to stay on to uh, start another, a, a new project uh, working, uh, building off of the data that we're collecting now. So uh, that's, that's all in, in process, uh, um, but uh, uh, stay tuned and maybe I'll have some more to report next year. Cool. From Raymond, what depths do giant clams, to what depths do giant clams live? Yeah, so the, <laughs> the, the biggest limiting factor is light and they need to, most giant clams live in the shallowest waters to enable maximum light exposure. Um, you'll even find them in the intertidal zone where they can, the tides come in and out. The clams will stay in the, you know, exposed above water and will sometimes stay open um, because uh, they've adapted to be able to tolerate that. And uh, there are, a couple species of clams that can live deeper to maybe like uh, 20 or 30 feet. Um, uh, um, but uh, generally they're in the shallow waters. Okay, some more questions here. They're coming in, coming in, coming in heavy. From Mark. Yeah. What, what's that? I, oh, I read it, I read it. Okay, yeah. At what point does the, just so everyone else can hear it. 
At what point does the clam acquire its symbiotic algae? Is it born with it? Yeah, um, they, uh, they actually uh, get their algae before we can even see the clam. When they're plankton floating in the water column, when they're not really even visible to the naked eye, they do take in these cells um, of, of uh, algae uh, that are floating planktonically. They take it in as if they were gonna eat it, but instead of eating it, these little tiny baby clams uh, uh, distribute those algae through their bodies. And uh, once they settle down, they start the process of growing bigger to ensure they have more space for that algae to grow. In. So from the earliest stages. Yeah. From Peter, would your research help reduce algae flowing from the Caloosahatchee River into Pine Island Sound through clam beds? So that's so, a, you may know the Caloosahatchee River is local and Pine Island Sound is a, is a body of water sort of right, right, right by Sandville. So maybe not directly in, in the world in the sense that giant clams aren't native to be the land food. And um, I, so I can't comment on, on, on giant clams in this situation, but um, there is a lot of, it is an open question about how much different species of bivalves take in nitrogen and other pollutants from their surrounding environment. Um, and, and so uh, potentially this work could feed into the broader body of work with a lot of researchers like me who are trying to answer this question Oysters, for example, are a major cleaner of their local water supplies because they can filter gallons per day, each individual oyster. So across the oyster reef, you can imagine that's, that's uh, millions of gallons uh, a month that the oysters are filtering. And so uh, there, I do know some people working on those kind of questions down, uh, uh, you know, uh, employed by the state of Florida and other people. And so uh, uh, if my research could help with their, them answering their questions, that's uh, the more the merrier. From Nelly, how would you tell the age of a clam? Yeah, so um, if you guys are familiar with tree rings, um, just like you might count the rings of a stump to understand how old the tree was that lived there, we can do the same thing with the shells of a clam. We can uh, cut it out, cut the shell, uh, you know, to see a cross section, and we can count those little rings uh, through the shell. And uh, uh, some clams make them every year. Um, some clams make them every day, like the clams I work with. And so I can count 365 of those a year um, and uh, be able to know how old the clam is. Cool. All right, a couple more here from Emily. Do clams have different personalities? Dan mentioned some are troublemakers. <laughs> yes, uh, they, um, they do have different reactions to, um, you know, because just like us, um, their behavior is a function of their genetic background, uh, what kind of, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, what their history is as an animal. Um, and so they do have differences in their behavior amongst them. Uh, like a the one in the video I showed you taking the sample with uh, via syringe, uh, that one was very agreeable to that process. Other ones are way more skittish. Um, and, uh, and so there is some individuality to these plants. And, uh, um, and so it's been interesting to see they, that their behavior is complex. Um, and uh, and there's a lot to be understood about how they work and how they live uh, in their environment because it's a complicated process. Okay, two more questions from Jennifer. You mentioned giant clams can get into trouble moving towards light and like to be near others. Do they tend to move throughout their life or settle? Yeah, so uh, they, they mostly do this moving thing when they're small um, in the wild. Uh, it has been observed that a lot of giant clams will will be uh, you know uh, first recruiting you know first growing to juvenile size from the tiny tiny microscopic size in the shallowest waters and then mi migrating later using this thing called a foot it's basically a tongue like or organ that they can use to pull themselves mm -hmm. along the bottom and that's what they're using to move and also they're moving their shells open and closed to kind of walk along the bottom and so it's mostly when they're small that they do that. Once they get really big, they're pretty much static in place because they're so large, it's hard to really uh, pull themselves that way anymore. Um, so it's mostly a juvenile behavior. Will your clams reproduce? Uh, so right now they're all little boy clams. They are, uh, we call that in malacology, we call that being protandric. When they start as males, a lot of marine animals take this strategy of starting as males. And then after a few years of age, we will have some that become uh, hermaphroditic, 
uh, that have uh, female organs appear. And so they're male and female. And then at that point, they will spawn. And uh, it will be very interesting to see what they do in the biosphere ocean. Some of these clams will be remaining here permanently as a permanent exhibit uh, for people to admire. And it, I do hope in a few years, wherever I am, that we can, um, that, that I can come back and see that these clams have recruited and, and um, made, made another generation in here. There's never been grown in a tank this big. In a small reef tank, like, you know, some of you guys might have kept giant clams in a reef tank at home. It's a big problem if they spawn because they really can ruin the water parameters in the tank. Mm -hmm. Suddenly have a mass spawning event. But mm -hmm. here, it could be, it could end up being pretty impressive. Okay, two more for real this time. Uh, from Phyllis, is any of your research helpful to countries that are farming giant clams? Yes, yeah, so I'm hoping to uh, demonstrate with a paper I've been writing right now about the valvometry sensors um, to be able to demonstrate that that can be applied everywhere that these clams are grown. These clams started their lives in a captive breeding environment in a place called Palau in the Pacific. It's a small island in the Pacific, south of Japan. And um, um, that's where a lot of giant clams are grown. And they're also grown in Vietnam and Thailand. And, uh, and these days, most giant clams in the aquarium are captive, are, are captive raised, which is good for the wild clams because we actually, it's a win-win. Those, those clam hatcheries are actually re-releasing some, some of their clams into the wild to help recover their populations. And I'm hoping that these sensors can be applied all, all over the world to understand differences in their behavior in different places. We've already seen with my study compared to the two that were conducted previously that there are a lot of differences in their day night behavior and how they react to predators, et cetera. So I'm hoping that could be extended out in the future. Okay. And uh, last question from Mark. Are there any algae that can have a negative effect on clams in the wild or in the biosphere? Yeah, so uh, giant clams, um, they need extensive access to light. And uh, a big problem in wild reefs is, is uh, uh, when pollution uh, from fertilizers and, and sewage and other sources of unnaturally high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, when those are released in the environment, that fertilizes all the algae that's floating around. And that can grow excessively to the point that it overgrows the corals and the clams on coral reefs. It's a major stress, source of stress for coral reefs around the world. Because we use fertilizer for good, you know, perfectly good uses uh, growing our crops, but uh, we need to manage that fertilizer more extensively to make sure we don't harm our coastal ecosystems releasing that into the wild. So that is a big problem. And even in biosphere, um, there were tons of algae that had to be removed in recent years because of, it was overgrowing and, and choking out the environment. And, and, these days, the algae is under more control, but it uh, that took a lot of work. It was an interesting microcosm of the broader problems facing the reefs. Okay. Well, Dan, thank you very, very much. Thank you, audience. Terrific questions and uh, great presentation. Energy and material just is wonderful. Really interesting and cutting edge work. Also, just a, a personal thanks to Dan for the time you put into this, but also from afar, not having been here, being a supporter of the museum. So we, we appreciate that, not only, not only following us on social media, but also, but also supporting the museum as well. So we look forward to the day when, when you can come visit here in person, uh, check out our, our giant clam aquarium and, and everything else here, and um, it'd be great to meet you in person. So um, thank you everybody for joining tonight and Thank check you. out our website for, for the next lectures. And we hope you enjoyed it and have a good evening or rest of the day. Thanks for the great questions, everybody. Keep up the shell and keep up the good work. All right. All right.